Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our Ramadan session. Inshallah, this will be, we'll have a short talk on Ramadan by Dr. Jasa Auda, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, before we get started, I'll start with some Quran, and then I'll introduce the topic for today and our guest, and then I'll let Dr. Jasa start, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فما كان منكم أمريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فما تتوع خيرا فهو خير له وَأَتَصُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنْزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هُدًى لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْمِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ فَمَا شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ وما كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون وإذا سعلك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداع إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون صدق الله العظيم So today's event is hosted by MAC. Uh, MAC stands for the Muslim Association of Canada, and MAC is a national rel and religious and non-profit organization. MAC's mission is to establish an Islamic presence in Canada that is balanced, constructive, and integrated through distinct in the social fabric and so culture of Canada. MAC, through its diverse programs and activities, including a MAC Islamic school, youth programs, MAC Give, Al-Islam Academy, MAC United Soccer Club, and Iman Eats Best, and others. For more information about our programs, visit our website, uh, www.maccalgary.ca, or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at MAC Calgary. So today we have a guest speaker. His name is Dr. Jasser Auda. Uh, Dr. Jasser Auda is a professor uh, in... Islamic legal theory, especially in the higher purposes of Maqasid of the Islamic law. He is a president of Maqasid Institute Global, a think tank registered in US, USA, UK, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and a visiting professor at the Center for the Study of Islam at the Carleton University of Canada, a visiting professor at the Rule of Law Institute, Faculty of Law, Loyola University of Chicago, and Al Shatibi, Chair for the Maqasid Studies at the International Peace University in South Africa. So, inshallah, today, Dr. Jasa Auda, he'll be talking about Ramadan with a focus on fasting and zakah. Uh, he'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then, if you guys have any questions throughout the uh, talk, you can leave them in the chat box. And then, inshallah, at the end, I'll go through the questions and I'll ask Dr. Jasa Auda the questions. And we can have a discussion from there, inshallah. And if you're ready, I'll hand it off to you, inshallah, Dr. Jasser. Barakallahu feek, akhi. Barakallahu feek, akhi. Ahmed, mashallah, fatahallahu lek. 
جزاك الله خير فور ذا ريدنج بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أسعد خلقه وخاتم رسله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله ورضي الله عن المهاجرين والأنصار ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد It is such a pleasure to be back with the Calgary chapter of MAC and another Q&A session I had one of those a few months ago and we had a very interesting and lively discussion uh, this time um, the system is to type your questions I guess so will not be as interactive but inshallah we can chat even by text um, Ramadan is coming up um, my brother Imad read from Surah Al-Baqarah the verses that talk about Ramadan perhaps I could give some notes on these uh, in uh, a sort of an opening for uh, Q&A on Ramadan يا أيها الذين أمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying we believe uh, fasting is prescribed written كتب كتب in Arabic is to write uh, and to tie and بتك uh, which is the opposite of كتب is to sever so كتب بتك um, you know, قرأ uh, رقأ عرض ضرع. Arabic is like that in, in the most part, like old Arabic anyway. So كتب is the, actually uh, a way of tying. You are tied. You are committed uh, to to fasting. عليكم الصيام أو الصوم, and it's the same word that they have people of the book before us. كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. Prophets of Allah uh, had the same tashri'ah, had the fasting of Ramadan, and the Prophets of Allah had hajj, and the Prophets of Allah, I'm talking about all the way until Isa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had the revelation revealed in Ramadan, and there is uh, evidence from the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for these things as some sort of an explanation of it. Of course, the people of the book changed the fasting of Ramadan, into fasting from um, something that is white or something that has a spirit or fasting from chocolate or fasting from anything. I mean, over the centuries, they forgot the original fasting of Ramadan and they changed it into something else, not from dawn to sunset. And even if they fast and drink water, it's not even dawn to sunset anymore. And they changed the calendar that is the lunar calendar, that is the calendar of all the prophets. Uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Iddata Shuri and the life in Ashara Shahra fi kitabillahi wa makhalaqa al samawati wal ard in Surah Tawbah Allah is saying subhanahu wa ta'ala that he created heavens and earth in 12 months and on the day he created heavens and earth so Ramadan is actually a natural month it is, is a natural lunar month the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hajjat al-wada'a the last hajjah uh, before he died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the hajjah of farewell he stood on the uh, Arafah Arafat mountain and he made sure that we uh, adjust our calendars, if you wish, to what he said. So this was the day of Hajj, the 10th of the Hijjah, of the uh, Hijjah of Shahr al Muharram, minha arba'atun hurum. Allah made four months where people, Muslims, are not supposed to fight uh, in, in those four months and so forth. Uh, and this is the objective of Ramadan. And therefore, uh, we measure ourselves against that objective, whether we achieve taqwa or not. Taqwa, translated best in English, my perspective, as heedful, to be heedful, to be amongst uh, the heedful. Uh, awareness is fine, righteousness is bir, but taqwa is a very big concept uh, in the Quran. It's one of the central themes, actually, of the Quran. And throughout Surah Al-Baqarah, the rest of it, and throughout the Quran, you will find the taqwa with the family law and with the financial law and with, uh, you know, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala working for the year after and dealing with the people of the book and dealing with neighbors and fam- taqwa is in everywhere. So therefore, taqwa, that is the objective of Ramadan, means that we are better Muslims. So the the measure here is that by, by the end of Ramadan, we are better people. And uh, better people is tied to this Q&A because there are actually two sides of that. One is the practical side, to be more practicing. And the other side is the heart side. We have to have better hearts too. 
and that's part of the fasting of Ramadan. Um, they are counted days. So therefore, if you are uh, sick or uh, ill or um, on, on travel, then you fast a, a, another number of days, an equivalent number of days. And as you see that ill and travel is not really defined. And that's why uh, for the questions that will address that, I will uh, tell you that this is relative because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this sharia a, um, a, a magnanimous, a tolerant, a, an easy facilitated sharia. So whatever you consider fasting, whatever, whatever you consider the traveling, uh, or whatever you consider illness, that, that is going to impact you is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. Uh, a problem with one of my uh, teeth could make, you know, make me go to hospital or could make me also still fast. And I still have some aching, no problem, but I could still fast. Um, different readings, which means those who, who cannot uh, do it um, or those who can do it, but they are traveling and or, or sick, uh, then they have to fidyatun, ta'amu miskin. They have to give a, a compensation because, you know, see, fidya is different from kafara. When Allah says kafara, kafara is something you did wrong and you are actually compensating for it. You are uh, redeeming your, you know, something in the hajj that you did wrong and you slaughter a sheep for the poor or something of that sort. You are redeeming a mistake, but this fidya is not a mistake. Fidya is an equivalent. Uh, so that's the uh, ransom, uh, literally, which is an equivalent, really. So if you cannot fast, you are not in any fault. You are just doing something that compensates for your fasting. Fidya tun, ta'amu miskin, another reading, ta'amu masakin, all Arabic readings uh, and all Quran, because the Quran is read in, in many ways, uh, according to the Arab, to the Arabic uh, structures of language and and, and sentences. So miskin or masakin, whether you feed one person or many people or put this fidya in a pool and it goes for the poor. Uh, and if you volunteer, it's better for you. And if you push yourself and fast, basically my, uh, my casual translation, then it is better for you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to, to the man, who, who told him that, you know, my stomach is not feeling well. He said, drink some honey. Allah made the uh, cure in it. Uh, and he went back and told him, uh, no, honey is not really helping. He said, Allah is truthful and your honey is lying. So uh, it is better for us to fast. Of course, unless you have a warning that this is going to jeopardize your life or your health in a major way. Of course, I'm not talking about the cases where you are warned not to fast. Otherwise, you're committing suicide. And that's not Islam. Uh, but if you have difficulty and you fast, Allah is saying that's better for you. Uh, and your body, inshallah, will, um, will adapt to, to the fasting. And inshallah, khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun. If you know, or if you know better, you should fast. Shah Ramadan, alladhi unzil fihi al-Qur'an. Here is Ramadan, the month that the Arabs called Ramadan because it was hot at that time. Ramadan means hot. Uh, but uh, eventually, because it's a lunar month, it became um, in the winter and the summer. There is, so it, it's not uh, according to the um, solar calendar, but rather than the lunar, lunar calendar. Quran, as I mentioned, the Quran is revealed in Ramadan, and so is the Torah in the beginning when it was revealed to Musa, وسلم, and so did the Injil when it was revealed to Isa وسلم, in Ramadan, and that's why they also celebrated and fasted Ramadan. The uh, Al-Huda is guidance and Furqan is to know the good from evil. And Ramadan teaches you that, teaches you a certain awareness so that, you know, you have a feeling of what is right and what is wrong. And you, you acquire taqwa this way. Uh, if you witness the month, then fast it. Um, yes, the Prophet ﷺ went out to the desert and looked for the new moon whenever they can see it. Uh, but now we can calculate the visibility of the moon. And so we are fasting, inshallah, on, on April 2nd. 
because this is the uh, day when the moon is born somewhere in the world and it's visible. So we are going to be fasting about that. The point is not to break our fast in the first day of Ramadan, which is a natural day, natural calendar. Allah created it in the day he created heavens and earth, he said, and not to fast on the day of Shawwal first, which is the day of Eid. And the day of Eid, again, is natural, and the day of Ramadan is natural. There is no sha'ira, there is no ibadah here in going out and looking uh, with your naked eye or a telescope or any of that. Um, we can talk about that if you wish, but that's uh, just to answer this question as well. Um, and woman uh, cannot in the second time when he said if you're ill or you're traveling then you can compensate with other days Allah wants facilitation for you and not difficulty and this is the spirit of Ramadan really it's not a month of difficulty rather a month of facilitation um and you complete the days and the day of Eid you make takbir and so on and you exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the guidance he's given you and if my servants ask about me uh, he didn't say say uh, if my servants ask about me I am near I am close by he didn't say because it is uh, we don't have this, when, when we ask about Allah, Allah answers, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the Prophet sallallahu is not in the way uh, to that. And that is a, an important part that I, I called, like in the beginning, fiqh qalb, that I would like, I would be very happy if I received a couple of the questions about, because we always talk about fiqh al-jawarih, or the fiqh of the body, but we don't really address the fiqh of the heart. But fiqh is actually two things. And if you pray, or if you give zakah, or if you do hajj, or you do fasting, you have, you're doing two things, something with your body and something with your heart. So we can ask about the body and the visibility of the moon and the amount of dollars for zakah. Yes, but we should also ask about that taqwa that we need to achieve and the levels of fasting. You know, Imam al-Ghazali, for example, very interesting levels of fasting, fasting with your body and fasting with your heart and fasting with your tongue and uh, different levels of fasting and different ways of fasting. Um, Allah will answer our prayers if we, if we, if we you know, ask him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will answer our prayers, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I will answer them, let them answer me, let them uh, do istijaba, let them you know, uh, listen to what I say. And then, uh, the Quran is talking about a rafath, uh, and it's talking about many other words that are very polite Arabic words that mean uh, the relationship between husband and wife. But the Quran could be memorized by young and old, and it doesn't get into the details yet, it gets into the details by giving a metaphor about it. So, a rafath is the um, uh, the the uh, saying the the clear saying or w- when you are frank the frank talk if you wish and that rafath Allah subhanahu wa taala is giving as a simile for the relationship between a husband and wife hunna libasu lakum wa antum libasu lahun another expression that is absolutely um, for everybody and absolutely also revealing for those who are married and so on they are clothing to you and you are clothing to them uh, subhanahu wa taala is saying. Um, if, if you wouldn't be allowed all of this for the month, you would uh, be betraying yourself or you would be, have difficulty with yourself. And that is part of the gradualism that happened in the tashri' of Ramadan. And the Prophet وسلم, took the companions in, gradual, uh, in gradualism uh, in every matter of sharia. Some of the gradu- gradualism was from the easier to the more difficult, like the prohibition of usury, the prohibition of liquor, and so on, until they were able to reject the old uh, addiction. And some started with a tougher uh, hukum, like Ramadan, uh, not, not to have any relation all through the month. And if somebody sleeps during the night, they don't even do suhoor. And some very strict rules. 
And eventually the Prophet ﷺ eased it on them because it was meant to be tarbiyah. Uh, we are meant to have iftar and suhoor, but it was meant to be tarbiyah for the companions. Uh, so it now touch them, uh, another polite word. Uh, so eat and drink until you see the white string from the black string. And uh, we can talk about the uh, sign of Fajr uh, anyway. Uh, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, he saw, you know, the, the light, yani, the, the, the Al-Mu'tarad Al-Ahmar, he said the Fajr is the red light that is horizontal and in, in the hadith. And Ubad ibn Samad, when he narrated, he said, I could, I was practicing with my arrows and I could see the arrow as far as it goes while we were making suhoor. So anyway, just to give you a hint on this angle business that we might be talking about if you ask about the angles of the sun and the sign of Fajr and why the calendars are different. Uh, our calendar that we follow here in North America, which is the Fiqh Council of North America, of which I'm a member, is actually the, the, the closest calendar from my perspective to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because it is closer to the light in the sky, which is Al-Fajr. Uh, but not the, the other calendars where it's really totally dark. Anyway, uh, different opinions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it open and his prophet because it's a matter of ijtihad. Uh, and then fast until the night. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ said, night is sunset. Some people wait until they see the stars. That is also night, but uh, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it easier on us. Uh, do not touch your wives or your husbands while you are doing i'tikaf in the masjid. Uh, so uh, i'tikaf is mentioned here where you isolate yourself and you purify your heart and, uh, whether for an hour or for a day. Uh, do not come close to the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ramadan, yes, there is facilitation and so on. But fasting is very serious. It's one of the pillars of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do not come close to the limits set by Allah in the fasting of Ramadan. Um, so I'll stop here, um, but inshallah we can have uh, Q&A as, as you wish. And I will get into some other points perhaps as we talk. And Zakullah khairan uh, for uh, this session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward uh, all of us for sitting and discussing uh, Islam and knowledge. And Zakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. All right, so we'll get started with the questions, inshallah. So the first question that we have is, what is the relevant age for our kids to start fasting or for them to get used to it? Uh, well, this has to do with the age of maturity or what's called al-bulugh. And... Um, the, the mainstream opinion or the, the majority opinion uh, is going to tell you that al bulugh is when the girl starts to have her menses or period and the boy starts to have a, a green mustache or a wet dream. Uh, I do believe, and I wrote about this, and as my brother mentioned, I teach usul al-fiqh. They, we call this mabhat al-taklif in usul al-fiqh. Uh, that is called the capacity, the, the chapter on capacity. When, when can you are... When can you be a mature person? I believe that in the Sharia, as in ibadat, not in the law. In the law, you set a date. You say 18. Under 18, you can do this. Above 18, you can make it 15, 17, 21. You know, this is law. But in the Sharia, it is different from the law. It is between you and Allah and fasting and so forth. And I, I think that it is relative. I don't think that it is exactly when the guy's uh, mustache is green or when he sees a wet dream, even if he sees a very early wet dream or he sees a very late wet dream at the age of, I don't know, 17 or he's eight and the girl, the same thing. It's not about that. I think it's a process. Uh, and yes, I know that um, we are used in the area of fiqh to have very definite answers, which I don't go give. The, the methodology that I follow uh, is a methodology that believes that Muslims should choose for themselves within the area within the hududullah, within the limits that Allah set. And I don't believe that um, we should make it very, very strict 
on people who ask questions because otherwise they will, you know, break the rules and go back. I don't, I trust Muslims. I think that the ummah is always guided. So therefore I'm telling you, it is a matter of uh, maturity, uh, physical maturity and mental maturity. And it is relative. So obviously not at the age of six or seven uh, or nine, I guess, and, and not obviously uh, as late as 17 or 19. 17 or 19 is a man or a woman, really, or a young lady, young man. But somewhere between those where a, a Muslim is mature enough uh, to be mukallaf, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is mukallaf or mas'ul or have capacity in the sharia, that Allah will ask him. Allah will not ask a, a kid who is 13 and she doesn't know and she's still very feeble and that she's still a kid by all means. Allah doesn't ask her. Versus another kid who is also 13 and she is a mature young lady. And, uh, you know, our grandparents said, uh, you know, at that age, they would, you know, start thinking about marriage. So th- like these are different, different people and, and different. So that's my long answer for the uh, question that it's really relative um, in terms of tarbiyah, in terms of education, uh, the way we deal with our children. Fast, ask them to fast at a young age. Um, it's, it's not going to harm the child to fast. But if the child is, you can see, is weak or is not really a tough uh, kid, kids are different, uh, then give them room to break their fast. Uh, they could start by breaking their fast at Dhuhr and then Asr and then Maghrib as they grow older. Or, but if at four they want to fast, they let them fast. They are not going to die. It's, it's good. Uh, Allah A'lam. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, how do we define zakah? And when does a person make zakah? And how much do we donate? Allah Akbar. Uh, I need a three-hour lecture for this. <laughs> but, uh, I, can, I can give uh, a quick answer. So, uh, zakah from tazkiyah uh, is originally a purification. Um, so zakah has two sides. We mentioned the fiqh of the heart and the fiqh of the body. So we are going to give zakah in Ramadan in two ways. One is to purify our hearts. That is zakah. That is part of what zakah should be. Even the zakah that we give at the end of the month, that is tohra, or uh, the Prophet وسلم, said that uh, it is tu'mal al-faqir. You, you, give, you give something for the poor to eat. Uh, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa it, it, it purifies your fasting. So you should give it with an intent to purify yourself if you're fasting at any mistake or you weren't really doing it perfectly and so forth. So zakah originally is purification. In the tashri'ah or in the legislation of Islam, zakah is to give from your uh, wealth that is accumulated or your produce that you produce. It's a long story, but in terms of an average person in Canada, Zakah is to find what your savings are and give two and a half percent of that for the way of Allah, regardless of the debates of what the savings are and where they are or um, fiat money. We, we could talk about that in another seminar where I can tell you that I have a problem with the current capitalist economy from the fiat money of, uh, up. But, but reality, reality is that I have savings. I have things that I'm not using. I don't give zakah on my house or my car. Or if I am a lady wearing a very precious uh, diamond ring, I don't give zakah on this. But if I um, instead, if, if I store diamonds or pieces of gold, or if I'm saving them, I'm not wearing them, I'm not using them. They are actually what Islam calls kens or treasure. Uh, and that kens is originally not recommended. You are not supposed to have uh, so much extra things. But of course, in modern life, we all have savings. We all have things that we try to put aside so that if the, you know we have issues with the economy or with our jobs then, or we retire or these kinds of things. So whatever you consider is saving, give to one half percent of it. If you are a person who does business and you don't really have savings because all your wealth is in the market, uh, ah, that is different, that you are a millionaire, but you don't have $10,000 in your checking account. Uh, then, no, then you calculate what you have in the market that is yours, not in partnership with others. Otherwise, you calculate your percentage and not something that you gave as a debt and you're not really expecting 
that company to pay back or something that has a court case to resolve or like things that are iffy, not really your possession. So if you are, as I mentioned, a millionaire, but all your money is in the market and you only have, uh, I don't know, not enough in your saving or checking account, then check everything that you have and give to an half percent of that as well, because that would be considered a cash wealth. If you would like to go in the market and collect all of this, you will have a million dollars. Therefore, you give those uh, 2,500 that, it, what, uh, two and a half percent? Oh, 2,500, 25,000, actually, uh, out of the, the $1 million. That that's that would be your, your zakat. Uh, if you are somebody who's doing farming, I'm not sure of the names here, anybody from the countryside in Canada, or uh, if you are a farmer, there are certain rules. Uh, if you are uh, using technology for your farming, then you are supposed to give an equivalent of 5% of your produce. And if your produce is natural, uh, you're you know, using grain or lakes or something that is not really, you're not putting effort in it, then you give 10% uh, of that. And if you find a treasure hidden in the ground uh, or you are mining, if you wish, then you give 20%. Uh, and so forth. There is a whole fiqh of zakah. If you have a particular question, please ask. I could try to answer you. Uh, but the zakah originally, by the way, in Islam, is what the government should collect. Uh, that, of course, when in Canada, the government is not going to collect zakah. Uh, of course, if we tell them that we have zakah, they'll be more than happy to collect it. <laughs> well, I'm not sure they will give it to the poor and the needy and so mm. on. Uh, but anyway, they will put it under taxes. But I am saying originally in the Islamic system, Zakah is part of the government role, not an individual thing. This is originally mm. what it is. But we are compensating for this yeah. duty that we should give to the authorities so that the authorities use for mostly relief. Really, if you look at the Zakah, what's supposed to be given, Surah Tawbah, for the poor and the needy and those who are in debt and the wayfarer, really that the relief work uh, of the society, we're supposed to give the government, the government should have a separate account and give that. No government does that, even most of the majority countries, since the colonization time, this was canceled. And that is a major part of the Islamic economics, by the way. That's a major part of how the system runs in Islam. Uh, so we, as individuals, are going to do that to give to organizations. Um, even if the organization is endowed, uh, you should have no issue giving the zakat to it, because it Islamic organizations really in Canada, they kind of replace the government in many, many things. The government, the Islamic system, uh, for example, doing relief. Uh, there are organizations that does relief. That is the role of a government in Islam. So we can give our zakat to those. We can give our zakat to educational endeavors, anything under the banner fi sabilillah, for the sake of Allah, something that is done purely for Islam. It's not a business. Nobody is making profit out of it, except for the people who work make a salary. Yeah, you can give zakah for that, inshallah. If you have particular questions, uh, more than happy, inshallah. Zakullah khair. So if someone, for example, let's say they have a depreciating asset, they bought it, like let's say they bought a car at a certain price and today it's worth less than they bought it for. Do they pay zakah on the value that they bought the car for? Well, they don't pay zakah on the, uh, the, on the car because the car is something you use. Uh, mm -hmm. like you're, you're not supposed to pay zakat on something you use. But okay. let's say they bought a bar of gold that used to be 50,000 and today it's 120,000. Uh, then they pay zakat on the uh, value of today uh, because today's value is what they have. And therefore they give zakat on that, on the value of today. Okay. All right. So the next question we have is, what are some tips that you have for us to prepare ourselves spiritually for Ramadan? Wallahi, akhi, yani direct your heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The journey to Allah is a one-step journey, <laughs> which is to direct your heart towards Him. It, it, of course, I mean, you can, you can try to push yourself by, you know, buying uh, new clothes for tarawih and putting lights in the house and starting to get rid of your coffee so that, you know, you can start to do these kinds of things. <laughs> But I think the, the best advice is to try to direct your heart, find your heart somewhere inside and try to direct it towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, so that, it, you know, the Prophet ﷺ taught Mu'ad, Allah, Allah ma'anya ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. 
Oh Allah, um, help me to remember you, to thank you, and to worship you beautifully. So if you internalize this, not just say it, if you internalize, you're asking Allah to help you to worship him in a better way and to remember him in a better way uh, and to direct yourself towards him. Um, scholars said, uh, scholars of the heart, they said to direct yourself is to look at your sins and at, at Allah's bounties. And your sins will open the door of fear or awe. And the bounties will open the door of hope or mercy. And you look at the bounties of Allah and you try to thank him and you look at your shortcomings. You be very aware of them. And if you think that you don't have shortcomings, you're in great trouble. Uh, look for your shortcomings where they are and try to look for them and enter Ramadan this way. Like, I, these are my problems. I need to really be a better person this way. And these are my bounties that Allah gave me. I need to thank him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and be a better person and, and give back to humanity, etc. So that is, um, so, and therefore to do tawbah, to repent. Don't enter Ramadan while you are continuing to do something wrong. You know, an inheritance that you took from a relative or um, a parent that you're not uh, treating very well or husband or wife or something that you did that you took from somebody. So, tawbah. tawbah is to repent, to regret and to uh, fix what you can fix if it's something that is fixable or if it's not fixable, you ask Allah to, uh, to, to accept your repentance. So from here until then you repent so that you enter Ramadan, inshallah, with a clean heart, inshallah. All right, for those of who, like, just joined, uh, you guys can send your questions in the chat box, inshallah, if you joined later. Uh, so the next question we have is, yep. can we pay zakah using the accumulated interest from the bank? Oh, man, the interest is issue is, is quite an issue, actually. Uh, well, I actually, an interest, an interest on savings, is a riba. Okay. Uh, but but so is a a, a twenty dollar paper. That is riba. <laughs> you see. Um, so my point is, uh, let 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 us. I mean, let us go by considering that interest is riba. Let us give it for sadaqa. Uh, and let and let not let us not count the sadaqah uh, as part of our zakat. So if I have a uh, hundred dollars that is from interest, uh, then give it for sadaqah. But I meant to give the first introduction because I meant to say it's not that simple. A, a riba is not just equal to interest. If we want to have a riba free uh, economy, we, we need to do so many other things. <laughs> I mean, the economy has to be very different. And therefore, I tend recently to give fatwas to people to just use the banks, uh, unfortunately. And, and I tell them that's riba. I do. But uh, I tell them that um, it, the system is like that. And uh, it, it is not. And I know that this, again, would need a seminar where I explain and a couple other scholars to discuss. But, um, but I'm just telling you, um, continue to deal with you know, the bank as you deal with it, but uh, the interest that is clear, that is just for, you know, giving the bank uh, like a credit and they give you an interest, just give it out for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not part of your zakah. Your zakah is different. Okay. Um, so the next question we have, what relationship in your view should the Muslim have with the dunya? like in terms of money or their fitness during Ramadan, is it the same as any other time of year? Allah, well, يعني usually uh, the, the, the advice is to uh, take care of the dunya as much as we take care of the deen because Islam is a center point, a wasati religion, and therefore we have to balance the deen and the dunya. So do not stop to continue your exercise and do not stop to eat well. And that, that is the typical answer. But I would, I would, ask you to try to imbalance this a little bit towards the deen more than the dunya because i think we we do so much dunya here and uh, in, in where we live in canada i know we have some challenges as muslims 
but um, uh, the, for the most part, Muslims in Canada are somewhere in the middle class, and that's a very comfortable uh, living versus many, many places around the world. So uh, do I continue to do my dunya? Yes, but try to give more time for the deen, uh, what you consider deen. Try to, yes, spend on your meals and so on, but try to perhaps eat simpler meals and give to the poor. Um, you, you know, spend on whatever it is uh, as you normally do or uh, your usual, alhamdulillah, halal uh, desires, but try to be aware that Ramadan is a very special time and try to be imbalanced a little bit between the deen and the dunya, focusing on the deen a little bit more. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the last 10 days of Ramadan, Aisha said, uh, she would say that he would uh, isolate himself from his wife. It's not haram, but he would isolate himself and he would worship Allah almost all night and he, he would do things that he normally doesn't do, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just to, to push himself towards the last 10 days of Ramadan. We need that uh, much more than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Um, so someone asked, if I'm traveling on a day of Ramadan, when should I break my fast? And can I break my fast before traveling on that day? Or do I need to fast only and break my fast once after I've completed my travel? Well, I advise you not to break your fast um, because uh, fa traveling is becoming very easy. Uh, and uh, the Sahaba عنهم, had a debate over this. And then uh, eventually they, they had a, some, some sort of a consensus that if you come fast, you fast. But if you get really, really tired, then you break your fast. So don't break your fast just like because you're traveling. Uh, when I was a student back, I remember back in University of Waterloo, I remember uh, students uh, going to uh, from Waterloo to Kitchener, which is like five kilometers, uh, and then back. And then they break the fast. Every day they do that in Ramadan. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, um, or, or sometimes we travel, depending, uh, if you travel comfortably and it's just for, I don't know, you're in Calgary, from Calgary to Edmonton or whatever, it's not really a big deal. So you don't break your fast unless you really need to. When to break your fast? When you are already in the travel, not from the beginning of the day, because something might happen and the flight uh, doesn't go. So you are in the same city and you are supposed to be fast. So, but once the flight is out and you are away from the airport, then, then you are already a traveler. So don't break your fast until you consider yourself to be a traveler. How many kilometers? It's not like that. I know some debates in the fiqh 84 and 83 and, and therefore, if you're 81 kilometers, you're not traveling. And if you're 84, no, no, that, that is the fuqaha sometimes like to be really Greek in their, in their logic, but it's not like that. Uh, what you consider traveling, which is the opinion of many other fuqaha that are more uh, comprehensive, if you wish, Ibn al-Qayyim, for example. Uh, safar is what you consider traveling. So if, if I consider my you know, next door city to be a travel and I will have some difficulty because I'm driving, I don't know, a truck, and like, then, then you can travel, then you can break your fast. So again, it's relative and it's up to your taqwa, up to what you think. If you don't break your fast, it's better for you, inshallah. Okay. So somebody asked, do we pay zakah if we have student loans? And can I claim a tax deduction for paying my zakah? Uh, the, the loans are not supposed uh, are supposed to be um, counted like your your savings. You're supposed to subtract the loans from the savings. Like the, you know, if 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 you have savings and you have loans that are more than the savings, then just then you don't have to pay zakah because you are poor. You consider poor. So that is the definition of that. Uh, and if you, what was the second question? Sorry. Uh, can I claim? Yeah, yeah, tax you can deduction. claim tax receipts and so on. Yeah, of course, it's not yours, really. Uh, so if you claim uh, something back, have the intention that the government is trying, is giving you that for the sake of charity work. The, you know, why do we get back? Because we have a policy in Canada that is trying to uh, promote civil society in, in our democracy. And it's one of the good sides of, of that democracy. And But I, do, I should not consider that I paid two and a half percent, let's say $2,500. The government gave me back 500. I should not consider it to be part of the 2,500. 
I should consider it to be an incentive to give more. So intent is very important because those 2,500 are not really yours. They are not yours. Uh, like the zakah money is not mine. It's actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and it would be better if the, if the government is going to give you 500 that you paid back to charity. I would do that. But you don't have to do that. But your intent has to be is that this is a government incentive. This is not really paying you back your zakah because you're not supposed to get back your zakah. Allah okay. All right. Uh, no, next question that we have is, is it acceptable to adopt the scientific method of determining the beginning and end of Ramadan and leave the traditional method of moon setting behind? Yeah, exactly. Of course, because the traditional method is a scientific method too. But it's a scientific method of its time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, if he had known that tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan, he would not have gone out and looked for the moon. Um, but it's, I come from the Arab world. I grew up uh, there, I'm, you know, grew up in Egypt. I'm originally from Mecca. I know the politics of the region, especially in these two countries. Um, it's, it's a very political issue in, in the Arab world. Uh, and therefore, you know, who is the leader of the Arabs? <laughs> they are all followers anyway, but it's a big deal for them who is the leader. And therefore, they spend some of their uh, wealth or the wealth of their nations that they steal uh, to really uh, to, to promote their, their politics. Uh, and therefore, it's a huge deal uh, who should look the moon and who follows who and, and to fast according to Mecca. There is no, nothing in the fiqh, by the way. That is called fasting according to Mecca. There is Wahdat al Matala, Wahdalaf al Matala. The Fuqaha, all along our history, had two opinions. One is one citation and multiple citations. Nobody said Mecca. Nobody said uh, Lahore or Cairo or uh, Istanbul. No, there's no opinion in fiqh that says I fast according to Mecca or Istanbul. There's nothing like that. You either fast if the new moon is born anywhere in the world. They call it Wahdat al the unity of uh, citation. Or you fast in your region. They call it Ikhtilaf al matala the variety of citation. So what um, in, in North America and in different parts of the world um, that, that do calculations, we decided that the Wahdat al the unity of citations, is much more efficient because the, um, the, the um, relative citation, or I, I'm in Ottawa here, so I, we have to cite in Ottawa. But Kanata is a bit, a little bit outside Ottawa. It, they might have different citation. So we're going to have a, a, a citation in Ottawa and in Kanata and all the way to Toronto, five, seven citations because there are many cities. Uh, no, we, like it's going to be very impractical. And um, it is not like the old days. So in the European Council of Fatwa and the American Council, I'm a member of both, uh, we decided that we are going to take the unity of citations that if it appears in Argentine, in Nigeria, uh, it, it appeared in the Senegal a few years back, and some Arabs didn't want to follow the Senegal because it's an African country, you see. I, I heard this from some of my relatives. No, no, Islam doesn't have that. If it appeared in the Senegal or Argentina or Russia, then it is, it, it is a moon, uh, it is born. So Wahdat al in that sense, uh, is the calculation of the visibility of the moon. We calculate, by the way, the visibility, not the birth, because the Prophet ﷺ said, so uh, when, when you can see it. So we calculate those uh, visibility. When, when is the moon thick enough for a human eye to see it? Anywhere in the oceans and land. And if it's born like that and it's big enough, then it's, inshallah, it's the beginning of Ramadan. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so this next question, uh, someone said, Assalamu alaikum, I have a very specific question related to health condition. My husband had a surgery after which the surgeon told him that due to the removed part of his body, his body cannot absorb water, and hence he must continue to water, drink water on a regular basis, and this was in 2012. Subhan. Two years ago, he started to handle himself for up to 12 hours, and from 2012 to 2018, he was giving fidya, knowing that he will never be able to fast. Should he calculate and perform his missed fast during winter months, or is it not necessary? No, no, it's not necessary, inshallah. It's not necessary. Um, the, the fidya, if you cannot, uh, you don't have to uh, make up in, in the winter month. Um, because there is, like, 
from the question, I really don't know, but from the question, I can see that he is pushing himself to the limit. So up to 12 hours afterwards, there will be a difficulty on him. So even nine or 10 hours or 11, it's not like that. It's not, I mean, medicine doesn't go by the minutes exactly. Maybe he will fast for 10 hours. It will impact him. And the last thing that, uh, you know, the Islam wants is to have a negative impact on your health because of ibadah that you do. It's not the purpose of it. So from the question, the way I see it, and I'm not a specialist um, in, in the case that you're talking about, so I don't really understand the medical case. But from what I see, no, don't play with like, he can fast up till to 12. So let's do 10. No, don't, don't do that. And uh, just give the fidya, inshallah. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Inshallah. All right. Somebody else asks, how do I know that I've reached the highest level of fasting? I know the answer in theory, but how do I make sure that I've reached this level in reality? Wallahi, when you, from dawn to sunset, the highest level is to, is to think about uh, nothing uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your heart has nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when he was asked a similar question about the Salah, he said, if you pray two rak'ahs with nothing in your heart, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allah will give you Jannah. Because it's impossible, it's almost impossible, yeah. So the highest level that we should, uh, you know, try to achieve is to be always, it doesn't mean by the way, to sit at home or to take a day, days off or, no, you continue working and you continue to deal with life. But fasting is in your heart. You remember Allah and you are really ap applying what you know is taqwa. You see, there is no higher level for that. I mean, there is, you really cannot measure it. Um, but but we, we try our best. Allah Okay. Uh, another question we have is what kind of health problems would be legit for someone to skip fasting in Ramadan and pay fidya? Uh, this is up to you and your doctor. And um, I am saying up to you because you are a good Muslim who is trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you really don't want to, um, you, you don't want to do something wrong in Ramadan. Uh, and therefore, you are going to be very keen to fast. But you also don't want to do something wrong in Ramadan by harming yourself, because harming ourselves is also a sin. And if I am not sure if I can fast or not, then I go to a doctor that I trust, a family doctor or uh, whoever who that that has medical experience and i ask them am i can i fast what is fasting you tell them how many hours if they tell you well no 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 this is not right and you are going to harm yourself then listen to the doctor if they tell you well there's no problem yes you do have diabetes but you can take a pill in the morning a pill for iftar and you are fine uh, then you could continue so i cannot really give you a a name or a degree um, you know, a certain number of blood cells or level of sugar or blood pressure. It, it's not like that because it's not definite. It's relative from person to person. Ask your heart, as the Prophet ﷺ said. And if you're confused about some technical issues, then ask your doctor. Uh, Allah Somebody else asks, can we pay zakat for Islamic centers and masajid in Canada? Uh, yes, because they are fi sabilillah by definition. Uh, you might not like the way they are managed or the imam says, you know, some foolish things sometimes, whatever it is, but it doesn't mean that the masjid is not fi sabilillah. The masjid, when you build the masjid, you are, uh, un unless it's a masjid that is built to, you know, masjid durar, you know, munafiqeen in Medina, they built a masjid to spy on Muslims and to wage a war and to assassinate the Prophet when he goes there and prays, you know, unless it's that kind of masjid, alhamdulillah, we don't have this in Canada. Muslim organizations uh, build masjids for the sake of Allah. You know, some sincere people want to do service. So yes, you can, inshallah, give zakat to the masjid, uh, to the schools. You want to make sure, though, that uh, you tell them that it's zakat because uh, the person who receives the zakat, uh, there is a difference between different ways of paying the charity, not, not everything uh, would be part of that. Um, 
but it, it, it just just put it in, like in other words, put it in the zakah box because the masjid people would know that this is zakat al fitr. It has different ways of spending than zakat al mal, uh, th- than the, the general donations that could go for um, supporting a campaign for something on TV or yeah, it's fi sabilillah, but it's. You know, I I would love to put my zakat in in what, the box that's called zakat, so that they know what to do. You know. Okay. Somebody asked, can we pay? Uh, can we fast for someone who's who has passed away? No, no. Subhanallah, it's a matter of difference of opinion. But uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's the sunnah uh, proves to us that yes, you can do something uh, for the sake of giving a gift to somebody who passed away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he accept this gift, inshallah. So the Prophet sallam told the woman uh, who, who told him about her mother uh, in, in one version of this hadith that, uh, you, you know, my mom passed away. He said, if, if she had the debt, would you have paid the debt? She, she said, yes. He said, then do hajj for her. So it's, it's um, inshallah, it will uh, pass through. Uh, th- to to the person. Some people say, no, each individual, when they die, nothing else will help them because we are in charge or responsible only for our deeds. Yes, but this is part of my deeds because he was a good friend to me. I'm doing Umrah for him or because she was my mom. I'm fasting for her or giving this charity for her or because you see, you're not making a, a gift to somebody totally unknown, somebody that you feel grateful for. So that is part of the good deed they did. You see, Mm -hmm. I'm fasting for that, you know, person who who died in a war uh, or whatever. Then you are are just fasting for somebody who did something good, you see. And that is part of their work. It's not uh, beyond their work. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Somebody asks, do I have to have savings to make zakah? What if I do not work or have an income? Should I still make zakah? Uh, well, the, 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 what is called nasabu zakah or the minimum that you have uh, under which you don't pay zakah above of which you pay zakah. They used to calculate it in a number of grams uh, of gold or silver. Grams and silver of gold and silver used to be very equivalent to, like in the old times. Now, of course, the silver is much cheaper and gold is much more expensive. Um, made the calculation based on some um, paper that I wrote in fiqh. Let's say if you have a couple thousand dollars or less, then you don't pay zakah. Uh, really under $3,000, let's put a 3,000 Canadian dollar as an approximate estimate. Uh, because I think we need to revise the way we define poverty and richness from the old times. Fiqh-wise, I think we do need to make this revision. The UN defines it as a dollar a day or two dollars a day now. Uh, I don't think this is an Islamic measure. The Islamic measure needs uh, to be defined in a particular way. But let's say if we go by the number of grams of gold and so on, let's say that uh, under $3,000 or uh, so, you don't pay zakah. If you have anything more than $3,000, give 2.5% of it. So if you have cryptocurrency and let's say you bought it at a certain price and now the, the, the value has dropped, do you pay zakat on the value that it's currently at? Yeah, well, on, on the day on the day you uh, pay zakat. Okay, now t- two opinions uh, of the scholars, and I- I'll tell you what, what I think is more preferable. One opinion is whenever you gain something, you wait for a year, and if you still have it, then you pay zakat on it. So you have a long Excel sheet where any money that comes to you if you are a person who doesn't have a, like a regular salary, then you put 100 here, 2,000 there, 3,000, and then you see if this 100 stays with you for a year. Like, I think this is very complicated. The easier way, which is the way that is more fit with our contemporary times, is to choose a day in Ramadan, because in Ramadan, you have multiple rewards. So that's why in Ramadan, we pay zakat. Mm-hmm. Mid-Ramadan, let's say. Uh, I personally do that. Mid-Ramadan, I take it as a day where I look at whatever I have in, in savings and I give zakah based on that. So mid Ramadan, you assess this cryptocurrency. Uh, you know, now the Russians are dealing with it, it's gonna be high. 
uh, good for you. Give two and a half percent out of it because now you're a millionaire if you have some cryptocurrency. Uh, so mid Ramadan, you can fix that uh, for a day where you give. Of course, that's different from the produce. If I'm talking to some farmers here in the audience, therefore uh, the produce, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, وَآتُوا حَقَّهُ يَوْمَ حَصَادِهِ and give its right on the day it is harvested. The produce is different. So, okay. and some people say, people with very, very high salaries, uh, if you're going to give zakah every month, which is a system that our Ustad Sheikh Al-Qaradawi, for example, wrote a lot about it in his book, Fiqh Al-Zakah. I advise you to read that book. It's in English and Arabic, of course, obviously. It was originally his PhD thesis, and he wrote a lot uh, to increase that book into a quite an encyclopedia, really, on, on zakah in modern times. Fiqh Al-Zakah. Qaradawi, Q-A-R-A-D-A-W-I, for those who don't know him. And uh, he uh, wrote this on the high salaries. He wrote a chapter on the very high salaries. So he was saying that back in his country in Qatar, people make $50,000 a month. And at the end of the year, they don't have anything because, you know, the, the way rentier states work, people just, you know, money coming in and coming out. So he's saying, no, then they have to give the zakah every month. They make 50000 they give two and a half percent out of it. Uh, so if your salary is so high, but your expenses are so high too, and you don't have savings really, then you should give zakah from your salary. And that would be monthly in that sense. Okay. All right. Someone asks, in your opinion, Sheikh, what are the best ways to spend zakah money in a country like Canada? Well, I, uh, yeah, I'll give you my, my answer. Education. And it's not because I work in education. It's because we need education more than mosques and more than relief. And um, education, especially Islamic education, is very important because it forms your character and your identity. And as Muslims, we have a huge challenge with our identity uh, as Muslims. Uh, there are so many waves of so many other ideologies and we need to support Islamic education. So if it's me and I'm talking about Canada, I would give to the Islamic education. Relief, at the end, it's Canada. There are shelters and you can go to the governments and uh, the government and get food. And like, really, we don't have people who die of hunger in, in Canada. Of course, I'm aware that there are many issues. I've seen communities up in the north who are native. I have seen uh, beggars in Toronto. I, I know I lived in Canada for three decades now, but uh, I'm saying that relief has less priority really than education from my perspective in Canada. Um, and on, on the other hand, the uh, poor and the needy and so on, if you have relatives, then give, give to your relatives. That's very important because your relatives have a right on you. Uh, relatives that you're not responsible for, of course, not your children or your parents, you're responsible for them. I'm talking about your relatives, your cousins and so on, somebody poor, somebody in need, they have priority as well. Uh, and in addition to giving to educational projects, inshallah, that will keep Islam alive in this country. Inshallah. Uh, somebody asks, is there a way to know when Laylatul Qadr is? I know it's in the last 10 odd nights, but is there certain signs for it? Well, uh, there are there are a hadith that mention particular nights, the night of the 27th or the night of the 23th, uh, and they are sahih. So it seems that Laylatul Qadr rotates. Uh, it seems that there is some sort of an equation for it, that the Prophet ﷺ uh, went out from his room into the masjid and almost told the companions about it. But then the companions had a fight between them and he had to deal with the quarrel uh, between two of them. So he forgot. So he told them, I forgot because of your quarrel. Find it in the last 10 days. Some scholars say that in the morning, when you look at the sun, it's not really, you don't see it very bright. It doesn't hurt your eyes because there are so many angels and their wings blocking the sun. Um, it could be true, could be false. Is there a hadith about it? No, there is nothing like that in the hadith. In the hadith, Aisha anha, asked the Prophet وسلم, what do I do if I see it? If I'm certain that it is like, you know, if I if I feel that today I'm really, really comfortable and I feel it's like little Qadr and maybe it's from person to person. Who knows? Allah knows or from country to country or region to region or year to year. But if you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
wants you to you know give a dua then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al-'afwa wal 'afiyah fi dunya wal akhirah forgiveness and health in this life and the next so forgiveness and health in this life and the next um why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hide it so that we push ourselves for 10 days i mean if he tells us it's the 27th then i'm sure on the 26th the mosque will be empty on the 28th the mosque will be empty so but if at least we have 10 days then we kind of pull ourselves uh, and some scholars to to ask people to be very uh, you know keen to to get it they said no it could be any time from the beginning of ramadan no but that's not really the hadith is saying the last 10 days uh, yeah so Allah alam the last 10 days try to try to find it there is no sign inshallah Uh, somebody asked for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Do they need to pay fidya if they break their fast? Uh, yes, I, I take the easier opinion on this, uh, that they pay fidya, which is an average meal that you eat. Again, relatively speaking, you could be a person who eats for five, seven dollars. You could be a person whose meal is 60, 70 dollars. So just give an average meal uh, of what you do uh, times those 30 days. And I take the easier opinion in terms of breastfeeding or pregnancy and not to uh, make up for the days uh, of that because you, you really didn't have any chance. Uh, it's, you know, um, but again, it's, it's relative and there are different opinions. I'm giving you the easier opinion because the Prophet وسلم, as Aisha said, عنها, did not have any choice between two things, but he chose the easier. Unless it's haram. If it's haram, he's the furthest from it. But to take the easier opinion in fiqh is actually the sunnah. It's not a bid'ah or any of that. It's actually the sunnah. And yes, you take the easier opinion from the four, seven, six, nine, twelve madhab, however you consider Muslims to be, uh, which I consider everybody who says, like, Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, who's a scholar. So there are so many uh, madhab in that. I, I take the easier opinion that if she is pregnant or breastfeeding, that she breaks her fasting, and uh, give a fidya for that from her average meal. Allah uh, alam. Somebody is asking if you can give a brief summary about fiqh al-qalb. Wallahi fiqh al-qalb, Allahumma salli ala rasulullah. Fiqh al-qalb is um, a fiqh in which we ask questions about what we should be doing, but not in the practical sense, in the feeling sense. So what are these kinds of questions? The question about al-khushu'a, for example, how to concentrate, khasha'a yakhsha'u, in Arabic is a very telling word. It has to do with um, it, it, to, to humble yourself, to lower yourself. Uh, how to have khushu'a, how to concentrate in English, for lack of a better word, to concentrate in your prayers. Uh, that is a bab, a chapter of that fiqh. So scholars say, okay, when you pray, Think about the Jannah and the Nar. Think about heaven and hell. Stop at every word that you read and try to reflect upon it. Um, as I mentioned, think about the blessings of Allah on you and be thankful or think about your shortcomings and be fearful. Uh, so Al-Khushu'a, uh, Al-Raja, to hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is to uh, really um, rely on him. And reliance is another chapter in that fiqh. Uh, to rely on Allah and, and to, hope, to hope that he is going to give you the best outcomes. And to do your best and to be honest, uh, really honest, not just in the words, but with your heart and what you do. And, and to be sincere. Sincerity is a great chapter of that fiqh. Uh, I have a humble book. I don't know. I could send it to you on chat here or you can... Um, I'm not on any of the social media, but, but I can give my email to my brothers and sisters and they can send you, uh, inshallah. Uh, I have a book that's called Journey to God in which I dealt with uh, 30 of the wisdoms of an imam who called, who's called Ibn Ata'illah, uh, Ibn Ata'illah secondary. Uh, he has words of wisdom that to me is the best book of fiqh al-qalb, one of the best books really of fiqh al-qalb. Of course, the, the Quran is... Uh, uh, he, he is explaining the Quran, but in a in a more practical way, if you wish, in which he's talking about, uh, and in this book, I give some details on hope and fear and um, how do you deal when Allah gives you something that you think is good 
And how do you deal when you lose something or you grieve, uh, humbling yourself and considering yourself lower than what you humble yourself to, not higher. Um, and when you repent, how how do you repent? Yes, not just to say astaghfirullah. And when you make dua, how do you make dua? Not just to go on your knees and raise your hands, but to what? How do you, how do you do that? That is the kind of fiqh that would require some details uh, in terms of diving inside inside us and trying to find sincerity when we pray uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, we try to find uh, a a, um, a, a, a an idea that convinces us to be sincere. <laughs> you see, it's very difficult to be sincere uh, as long as people are watching you and so on. And sometimes it's very difficult, even if people are not watching you and you pray and you wake up in the morning and tell everybody, I prayed that night last night or, <laughs> or I, I fasted and this kind of thing. And But alhamdulillah, fasting, fasting is a very good exercise of sincerity, really, because mm-hmm. yes, you can close the door and eat and drink really seriously. Uh, but if you don't do that, then then you have a grain of sincerity in your heart. Uh, and that is good. Like you know that Allah is watching you. Build on that. Build on the grain of sincerity because you really don't close the door and eat and drink. And build on that to be sincere, even if a thousand people are watching you, to, to really do things for the sake of Allah. Okay, somebody is asking, do you recommend depositing our money in Islamic banks? Allahu Akbar. Uh, no, I don't. I think uh, <laughs> that, um, well, there is a difference between murabaha and mudaraba and qirat. Uh, I know that 95% of Islamic banks uh, do murabaha. I don't think that murabaha, the way Islamic banks do it, uh, is halal. I think it's riba. I think there is no difference between murabaha and riba because the bank is acting as a broker, but, but, but the bank is also lending you money. And, and the broker in Islam is not supposed to lend me money. The broker is supposed to be a broker or somebody who's working in a particular business and selling me in installments. So like details. So my general answer is no, there is no difference. But my specific answer that if you do what is called mudaraba or what is called qirad, qirad, the bank is actually doing development, like really like is, is participating with you in the project. That is a very small minority of what Islamic banks do. But that is what I think is purely halal because the bank is taking a risk and is giving you the money and is part of the project. But the bank is uh, going to give me the house. Uh, and before I leave the bank, I paid all the installments with much more than what uh, the uh, Canadian bank would give me. That is riba. Uh, and if you are going to put your money for investment in the banks, uh, you are going to support that. It's always difficult because uh, on the other hand, we need to support our Islamic uh, projects. Uh, so. If you think that the bank is aware of their problems and they would like to move from murabaha to mudaraba or qirat, then support them. If they are sincere, if, 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 inshallah, all of everybody is sincere, but if they are really moving from the no risk uh, way of Islamic banking to a risk taking partnership Islamic banking, that is halal, but no risk. uh, So, I buy a car for a hundred, and before I leave the bank, I paid already 120 in checks. That is riba, by definite textbook riba. So no, that is not acceptable. You call it murabaha, you call it afrit. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's not really halal. Allah ala. Okay, somebody's asking: Does insulin break our fast? Uh, no, not not in the blood. Inshallah, Allah okay. Allah said: Kulu washrabu, eat and drink something that you eat and drink. Um, okay. So no, n- not not in your blood, but of course, I mean, people like you should not be taking food in your blood. Like it's not like that. So insulin it, for your diabetes is not really you're not eating anything. You know, that's different from somebody who's totally healthy, and actually is t- t- taking uh, you know something to to make them not feel like no like like if it's not a trick around fasting. 
and you're just taking something in your blood. No, nothing, inshallah. You have to be eating or drinking it. And therefore, if you put drops in your nose or in your eyes, there's not food. Even if a little bit entered your, your stomach, it's not really food. It's not about that. That's why it's allowed in the Sharia to taste. Uh, if you're cooking, you can taste. Uh, there might be something that will go in, but you, you are not really, you're not swallowing anything. You're just tasting, you see. So that is allowed too. Allah Okay. Uh, somebody's asking zakah if it's paid, zakah or sadaqah, if it's paid with credit card, is it accepted? Oh, yes, inshallah. But in, in the, you are going to pay the credit card anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. inshallah. It's a debt. It's, it's basically a debt. So you're paying it with a debt. If you don't have anything and you're paying your zakah with a credit card, no, you don't have to pay zakah because you don't have money anyway, you see. But if you're paying it as a debt, the credit card is a debt at the end. And inshallah, you pay it before any interest, so it's not haram. So if it's a debt that you're paying, yeah, it's possible that I pay zakah. I ask somebody to pay the zakah for me somewhere, and then I go and give them what they paid. That's the same thing. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking, how much should I pay per day that I couldn't fast? Uh, depending on your average meal. Uh, let's say $10, $15, you know, something like that. Okay. So 10 times 30 would be $300. But if it's too much for you, I, I don't know, depending on who you are. Because in the Sharia, it's not in the dollars, it's in the meal. Ta'am uh, miskin, a food for a poor person. So however the meal is, that is an average meal of yours, inshallah. $10, I think, is the latest estimate that we have in the Fiqh Council of North America. 10 American dollars is the latest meal that we estimated. So let's say $12. Allah alam. There is always a minimum and a maximum, by the way. Like last year, I think, uh, in the Fiqh Council of North America, we said that the Qatul Fitr is a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 30. So you can give minimum of $10 per person of your family or 30 per person of your family if you're uh, well-to-do, see. So is it $10 per day? It's it's ten dollar okay. It's ten dollar per day for the fidya because it's a meal, yeah. And it's also for zakat al fitr, ten dollar per family person, for okay. a family member. You see, I'm talking about two things. Yeah, one yeah. is the fidya, and one is zakat al fitr, which is also a meal, by the way. Okay. That's why. All right. Somebody is asking, can you take some medication by mouth during fasting? For example, medication for a migraine if your headache starts. Um, how about taking? Uh, intramuscular injections? Well, I know that if you, if you take medication by your mouth, uh, then it breaks your fast. And if you are sick to that extent, then break your fast, no problem, inshallah, and, and compensate if it's just a headache or a migraine or something. Um, if you take a, 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 sh a shot or a needle, it doesn't break your fast. And I know that this is equivalent to this in terms of our minds, but fasting is a ibadah. And the ibadah, or what's called more accurately in the sharia, sha'ira, sha'ira is a ritual. So the ritual we do exactly as Allah told us. Allah said, don't eat and drink. But you can do medication. You can, you can inject something in your blood. You can, uh, you know, other things. But not to eat and drink. So we do it as a ritual, as a ibadah, as a sha'ira. And therefore, uh, I know they might be equivalent. But if you really need to take an anti, I don't know, migraine something, Take a needle instead of eating or drinking because eating and drinking will break your fast. Medication does break your fast. Okay. And then a very similar question. Someone's asking, does Ventolin puffer, uh, would that break your fast? If someone's taking a puffer for asthma, would that break your fast? Uh, no, inshallah. Inshallah, it wouldn't because the, the, original, the, the original purpose of it is, is not to eat and drink. It's, it's, not, it's not a pill that you are going to take. Uh, it's just vapor in your in your nose or so and and it's not meant to go in in your stomach i'm not sure what you're talking about if you're talking about something for your nose uh, no puffer a puffer it goes in your mouth oh like a puffer for, that you for your lungs yeah oh, for your lungs well oh. alam it it wouldn't break your fast because it is targeting your mouth your your, your lungs it's not targeting your stomach you're not okay. putting it in your stomach really uh, so when scholars debated these kinds of things, they tried to differentiate between what will enter your stomach 
and what will enter anything else, your lungs, Bukhur, for example, when they debated these kinds of things. So they said, no, Bukhur or this incense that you burn, it actually enters your lung. It doesn't really go into your stomach. Yes, one of a million percent will go into your stomach, but that's we're not talking about that. So if the target is your lungs, then it doesn't break your fast, inshallah. If the target is your stomach and the medication you're taking vaporized or, um, or hard is going to your stomach, then no, it, it breaks your fast. Because kulu washrabu, eat and drink is about your stomach, really. It's not about your lungs or your eyes or your ears. No, that, that, these are not fasting, inshallah. Okay, someone's asking, and this is the last question that we have for today. Uh, sure. Someone's asking, as Muslims, do we need to follow the lunar calendar rather than the Gregorian calendar? Uh, well, yeah, the lunar calendar is more accurate. Anyway, the Gregorian calendar, you know, Pope Greg Gregorus, uh, I wrote an article on that recently, when he uh, when he made the, the adjustment, um, it, it was quite erroneous. I can send you the article. I wrote, I wrote in Arabic, though. Um, it was quite erroneous. And therefore, there are like several corrections of this Gregorian calendar on, on how to calculate the year. Uh, go to NASA website, and there are some interesting articles on how inaccurate the solar calendar is and how off we are in the past couple thousand years by like 120 days uh, from the day we assume is the first day of those uh, common era uh, calendar. Uh, should we go by the lunar calendar? Well, uh, we should know the lunar calendar, but in Canada, we actually go by you know, the Canadian calendar anyway. Well, whether Gregorus or anybody else had invented it, we just go by Jan, February, March. Uh, but as Muslims, we should be aware of the lunar calendar and we should know that um, the Sharia goes by the lunar calendar. So when Allah talks about three months for a idda, uh, waiting period after divorce for a woman, that goes lunar, that, that is not uh, solar. When you calculate your zakah, by the way, because there's an 11th day difference here. So if you go every mid-Ramadan, this is a shorter year. Don't calculate zakah for 21 and 22 or 23, because that's a longer year. Otherwise, you should add uh, 11 over 356%, uh, you know, because this is... So when you calculate your zakah, uh, when you do the uh, anything that has to do with the mawaqit, we go by the lunar calendar. So originally, as Muslims, we're supposed to follow the lunar calendar. That's the calendar of the prophets anyway, uh, Hajj and Umrah and so on. But by the way, the Hajj, we follow the calendar of Mecca because calendar uh, Eid, Eid al-Adha, that is an Arafah, is tied to Mecca, is not Wahdat al-Matala ukhtaf matal the, the unity of, uh, Allah unity of citation. And the variety of citation is for Ramadan only, by the way. But for the Hijjah, we calculate Arafah in North America according to Arafah. Because Al-Hajj al, al is what is what is called Miqat Makani. It is a calendar that is tied to a place. So if it is the 10th of, Hajj, of the Hijjah in Mecca, then we go by that here in Canada. Even if the calendar is telling us that it's the 9th or the 11th. So we go by the calendar normally, but Arafat is the day of Arafat in Mecca. Uh, Ramadan, no, Ramadan is different. Ramadan is the day of Ramadan uh, in, according to the calendar that uh, we developed, yeah, inshallah. All right. I want to thank everyone who attended and asked their questions. I think we had a great discussion today. And uh, Jazakallah Khair, Dr. Masaouda, for giving us this opportunity to ask our questions before Ramadan Allah. and help us before. Allah Allah Allah. I will leave my email because I really didn't. Uh, I think I'm getting old. I didn't see the chat as I was speaking. Okay. Um, the font was a bit small, so I'll just put my uh, so that is my email, uh, panelists and attendees. If you would like to email me with questions, I'm more than happy. I'll connect with you. Barakallah uh, fikum. If you I uh, would like to read any of these uh, books or whatever that I humbly wrote about some of these issues. I can send you that, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. But Zakallah khair, very interesting discussion. Alhamdulillah. Zakallah khair, Akhir Ahmed. It was efficient that we receive questions this way 
even though I would have loved to see my brothers and sisters who asked yeah, the questions. Yeah. But uh, salam for, from me until we meet, inshallah, one day. Barakallahu alaykum. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaykum. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa tuwi ilayka. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr. Inna insana fi khusr. Al-lazina amanu wa amalu salihati wa tawasabu al-haqqa wa tawasabu al-sakh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.